In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Now we are coming to the end of the Great Lent, this journey that went by so fast. This coming Sunday will be Palm Sunday. The Sunday after will be the Resurrection Sunday. We have two more weeks before uh, we end this journey. And it's a beautiful journey because in it we had many revelations. It was revealed to us during the readings of this Great Lent that this journey starts with the restoration of a father and his child. And he wants us to restore that relationship as children of God to bring us back to him, to bring us back to his bosom. And he told us that this relationship starts when you genuinely look for God, not for any outward appearance, but, appear, but only because of genuine interest, that you go to your room and you pray and fast privately because you are seeking not to please men, but only to please God. In it also we learned that the guiding factor of all of our life is depends on what's in our heart. What do we consider to be a treasure? Whatever we consider the treasure, our hearts follows. If you consider the treasure to be belongings in this world, your heart will also follow. If you consider the treasure to be in heaven, your heart will also follow. We also learned that in this journey we will be tempted. And anyone who is fasting probably have realized, or any opportunity you take to take your spirituality seriously, you will realize that things start to come up. Hardships, temptations, tribulations. Starts to get presented to a Christian as he starts to walk the path towards Christ. We also learned beautiful stories. Stories of redemption and restoration. Stories of the prodigal son. The man, the young child who was lost and we came found once he came to his, his senses and realized that he was lost. We also learned the story of the Samaritan woman, the woman who lived for many, many years in sin, trying to find a, a man who will satisfy her, her need to be appreciated and loved and accepted, but find no one except when she met with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the transformation that happened in this woman's life. We also see the story and the man who is paralyzed, for 38 years, also he had no man. He had no man to push him, to restore him, and to recover him. Until our Lord Jesus Christ was that man who restored him. Today is yet another story of the man who was born blind. All of his life he was blind. A man who was born blind is the man who actually did not have any eyes. If you studied biology, you will realize how complicated the eye is, the human eye. Human eye is an organ. It has over 40 different components, 40 different components between the retina, the lenses, the iris, the muscles, the liquid inside the eye, the nerves, the arteries and veins, the capillaries. Very, 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 very complicated. We take it for granted. Actually, if you study uh, engineering, something called computer vision is one of the most and the hardest fields out there. Um, how you make a computer see and understand what it's seeing. But we take it for granted, of course. But this man, he was born without eyes. Right? He did not have any eyes. And our Lord Jesus Christ, he created a new pair of eyes for him. He went and he spat on the floor, and he created mud. And with that mud, he put it in his eyes, on his eyes, and he told him to go and wash. And he came back seeing. And then we see the conversation that happened between him and the Pharisees. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he did this miracle on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day that the Jews honor where they do not do anything. Because God said you have to respect that, the Sabbath to not do anything, to only focus on God and, and his works. But Jesus was doing good work. He was healing people on the Sabbath. But the Jews, they, they misinterpreted what does it mean to honor the Sabbath, honor God on the Sabbath. He, they thought honor God in the Sabbath means don't do anything. There are some towns... Right now, until today, the, the Jews are still following the same mentality. They don't do anything on the Sabbath. There are some towns that are full of, for example, uh, Jews, Orthodox Jews, who are very, very strict. They, 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 don't put, they don't do any work. They do not uh, turn on the uh, stove. Right? They actually have the stove on from the night before so that anything that they want, they, they need to cook, they just put it on the stove right? they without turning the stove on. Because they said in the Old Testament you should not collect uh, uh, wood. So they interpreted now with the stove. They did not turn on the stove. 
Right? You very, very they follow it to the letter. We actually have buildings that on, on the Sabbath, on Saturday, again, the, they don't go and push the buttons on the elevators. So what happens? The elevators, they program the elevators to go and stop on every single floor, up onto every single floor going down. Because they consider it work if you go and you push a button. Again, very, very strict rules, following the rules to the letter, that's not about losing the spirit. And we see this. I mean, they, they many, many, many times, our Lord Jesus Christ would be doing this very, very powerful miracles. A man who was born blind, God restored it, gave him new eyes. They would completely disregard this miracle, and they start to nitpick that he broke the law. He broke the law of the Sabbath. Happens over and over again. Today, for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be blind, and how can our eyes be restored? You know, many times we consider ourselves, you know, we have eyes. Thank God we all have eyes. We don't, I don't think any of us are suffering from any kinds of eye disease, at least in the physical sense. But many of us could be suffering from spiritual sightness, spiritual vision. And there are some symptoms. Just like there are symptoms of real blindness, there are also some symptoms of spiritual blindness or spiritual blurriness, right? And it's just as dangerous, and it's just as frustrating. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. So therefore, when we abide in Christ, when we abide in him, we will see, we will have that light. As when we are far away from God, we will not have that light. We will not be able to see. We will not be able to see ourselves. We're not going to be see others. We're not going to see our purpose. We're not going to see anything. Because our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I am the light of the world. We, this is why our friends, my friends, we do not do good without having a relationship with God. If we are separated from God, we are really in darkness. This is why people who could have everything, they could have the education and they could have the, the, the wealth and they could have the reputation and they could have the prestige and they're going to, if they do not have God, they are something, they are still living in darkness. They still feel they are missing something. This is why we see it over and over in the news. He has everything. And still, he's suffering. He's still there in suffering. Why? Because we don't do well without having God in our life. We are made in God's image and likeness. We are made part of him. Just like the fish cannot live outside of the water, humans cannot live without God. We cannot live outside of God. We need God. We need God in our lives. We need God in our minds, in our hearts. So what are some of the symptoms that we can have that could tell us that we could be suffering from spiritual blurriness or spiritual blindness? Number one, is our lack of seeing our own sins. Lack of seeing our own sins. We live just like everyone else. And we do exactly what the world is doing. The, whatever the world considers their priorities, we consider the same priorities. Whatever the world is doing is getting engaged in, we do that likewise. Whatever the world is doing, we do. That is spiritual blurriness. Spiritual blurriness is when we lack to see our sins. They, the Pharisees today in this gospel, they completely disregarded that a huge miracle happened. As they were not picking, I will to that man, to that man after his eyes were sin, glorify God. Hello, I will glorify God. This man is a sinner. You get? And he completely disregarded that his eyes was restored by a man, and he left all of that. And he said, this man is a sinner. He completely disregarded that he created a new pair of eyes. This is what happens when we disregard our own sins. We see it happen and happen again. Remember the story of the man who was committed, who was caught in adultery? Quickly, quickly, man, the men brought him to Christ. And said, she broke the law. Well, was, ah, she did break the law. You know, I'm not going to disregard that. She did break the law. That's who is from you who does not commit sin, different sins? Any had if he could not commit sin, let him take the first stone and start to cast the first stone. So the, a common pattern of us not seeing our own sins when we are too occupied, self-occupied with other people's sin. See what he did, see what they did, see how they're doing, see how he did. 
the more we are occupied with other people's sin, the less time we have to focus on our own sins. And if we do not focus on our own sins, we will continue to live in darkness. Today, the, in the reading from St. Paul to the Colossians, it said, If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in the body and be thankful. <coughs> Another common thing that we remain in darkness is not just because of us being remained in sin, but also not forgiving one another. If we do not forgive, if we do not forgive, we will remain in darkness. You will be carrying this burden on your shoulders and in your hearts everywhere you go. And you will never be free. If we do not practice the, 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 the virtue of forgiveness, and this is a, a condition every single time when we pray our fathers, it's forgive us, Lord. Forgive us as we forgive. Forgive us, it's a condition. Unless we forgive one another trespasses, yes, we will sin to one another. Yes, we will fall short. As our Lord Jesus Christ, who is perfect, He's perfect, right? And He forgives us. The, me and you, and we're not perfect. So the least we can do is to forgive one another for the lack of perfection. Right? Because the perfect one forgives. If the perfect one, if there's one person who's not supposed to forgive, is the perfect one, right? He's perfect. He has the right not to forgive. But he said, I will forgive. But see you being unperfect. We must learn to forgive one another. And we must move on. Because if we are holding grudges and resentment, I guarantee you, we will not grow spiritually. We will not grow in a life of virtues. You will be carrying this load with you everywhere you go. And you will be in standstill. This is another way to be into the light. It's when you learn to let go and to forgive. We become also spiritually blind or spiritually uh, blurry when we do not see our own value. Each and every one of you is created in God's own image and likeness. You are, you are the most precious gift at all, of all. You are bought with the most precious gift that is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he came, all of this that we're doing every single day in the liturgy, it's a reminding of how precious you are. That God came, took flesh to renew us. To bring us back, to, to restore us back. This is your value. I love this analogy. When they bring a, a hundred dollar bill, I, I, they, they take a hundred dollar bill, I saw this in a presentation, and he says he crumbled it. I said, What's the value of that bill? Still a hundred dollars. They take the hundred dollar bill and they put it on the, in, in mud, and they, they, they fill it with mud, and he just he wipes it off. What is the value of this bill? Still a hundred dollars. So if I take it and I step on it and I pick it up, it's still a hundred dollar bill. But we must not label ourselves. And likewise, we must not label ourselves with the mud that's on us, the dust that we collect. But yes, we will collect dust because we are sinful. And we we catch on. We catch on some dust. But that does your sins does not mean that this is your value. Your value is you are God's perfect image and likeness. That Holy Spirit that is in you, that makes you a saint. That spirit that was in the apostles that changed them from a bunch of men who were cowards and into these men who went to preach Christianity to everywhere, give them the courage. That is the same spirit in you. You are very valuable. You are more valuable, the card says, you're more valuable than, than many birds, than the sparrows, right? Because God is in you. The most dangerous thing that we do as Christians, when we label ourselves with our sins, you label yourself with your shortcoming. You label yourself that you're not perfect. Papa, I will never be perfect. And you know what? As long as we're taking steps to righteousness, you are a saint. Sometimes we think, Abuna, I'm not praying long enough. I'm not praying hard enough. I'm not fasting long enough. It's okay. A little bit of fasting, that means you're a saint. You're walking towards sainthood. A little bit of prayer, even in your, when your time is so busy and you have no time, a little bit of prayers in your car, that is considered steps towards sainthood. A little bit of, I can do a little this. I can maybe call on this person and check on them. 
That's acts of kindness. That's acts of that steps towards sainthood. Sainthood is not a level. Sainthood is a direction. Sainthood is not a level. It's, like, it's not like when I reach this level of prayers, this level of psalms, this levels of prayers, this levels of fasting, that means I'm a saint. No. In Orthodox Christianity, sainthood is the direction you're moving towards, not the distance you are, not the level you are. It's the direction you're moving. If you're moving towards the direction of righteousness, you aren't moving into the direction of sainthood. And if God remembers us in that days when he takes us to heaven, like, it's not where your level is. It's what was your direction. Is my direction towards Christ? Is my direction towards the virtues? Is the direction towards holiness? Not how much I pray, not how much I fast, not how much I do. It's not about that. There is no, no, nothing we can do that makes us holy or makes us gain God's mercy. Our points we collect to go to heaven. Or things that we're going to do to make us qualify to enter heaven. Because we'll always be sinners. Always. And we'll always lack. But what's important, and that is spiritual lightness, spiritual vision, is realizing that when we take small steps toward righteousness, and I'm coming to church, I'm pushing myself to come to church, that's good. I'm pushing myself to stay away from bad company, that's good. I'm pushing myself to, to forgive, that's good. I'm pushing myself to say, to watch my eyes and watch my ears, that's good. I'm pushing myself, I'm, I'm still not there, but I fall sometimes and I get up. That's good. That is, this, is the path of, this is the path of righteousness. This is what God wants from us. And we see it, remember in the, in the, in the cross, on the right hand side, the thief, was he, how many prayers was he praying when God told him, today you'll be with me in paradise? Zero. How, how many? I'm not saying we should not fast and pray, but so that, but, but the right hand, Steve, he switched direction. He was the direction of cr being a criminal. He switched. He looked towards Christ and said, you know what, Lord, we deserve what we deserve, but you are the Holy One. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. See? So it's not that he reached a level, but he switched direction. We must evaluate. Do not... Christianity is not a burden. Christianity is not a burden. Christianity is not a point system of things I must do to enter heaven. It's not. It's where am I headed? What, or what are my focus? I realize I'm weak and I continuously ask for forgiveness. Continually strive to become a better. More and more become more like Christ. That is the path of sainthood. To part of spiritual illumination or spiritual vision is realizing the concept of pain in life. This man, he was a beggar. He was in the temple. And I'm not sure if he knew about Jesus. But he was a beggar and he's already probably in the lowest of his lowest in his state, you know, in, in his life. You know, he, he, he reached what you call rock bottom, right? He is in the temple. He's a beggar. He has no eyes. Yet this man comes and he takes, he holds him, I can imagine he's holding the head of this blind man probably with a very strong grip and he gets this mud and he puts it in his eyes. I can imagine the feelings of this man. You know, not only I'm a beggar, not only I don't see, but I feel this thing that you're putting in my eye and I'm not comfortable with it. So what are you doing? What are, you, are you here to make more fun of me? Are you here to ridicule me? What are you doing? And then he goes and he tells me to go and wash with whatever you put in my eyes. I understand what you're doing, but definitely I never heard someone fixing someone's eyes by putting mud on it. It feels like sand. It feels like mud on my face. I know how it feels because I sleep on the floor, so I know what mud feels like. I know what sand feels like. So I feel this thing that you're putting in my eyes, on my face. And then you tell me to go and wash. Are you trying to make fun of me? This is what I'm imagining, the conversation the blind man is having in his head. And then he goes and tells me to go and wash. And he wants me to not only put 
not only you putting mud in my face, but then you want me, everyone to see that mud. I don't know where that, it's probably some distance away where that pool is. So I have to go and walk all that distance to go and wash my face in front of anyone. So not only I am poor, I am blind, and uh, everyone knows me because I've been there for a long time. I have to walk all this distance to go and wash my face with my mud, with that mud on my face. Yet he went and he followed. Yet he did and he followed. And this is what we, this is what we need to understand, the, under, the, the, the meaning of pain. Sometimes in our worst state, something harder even came. And I'm born, I'm born blind and I'm a beggar. And then you put mud and then I feel like I'm being ridiculed. So only when I feel things are, cannot get any lower, it gets actually worse. This is what it means sometimes in our spiritual life, in our life with Christ. Sad when to gain vision, to gain vision, sometimes God allows mud to be in our face. God allows hardships in our life, allows things that might be unbearable, things that might be very, very, very difficult. But we have to do two things. We have to have faith, he is doing the right thing for us. And number two, we have to follow the direction. When he says, go and wash, you go and wash. But Ulush, again, when you're making fun of me, and just why, he could have done this. He could have wiped it off. He says, leave me alone. And he walked away. Probably he would not have received his vision. But he went and he listened to go and wash. Sometimes we, God puts very, very hard things in our life. And I was like, God, really? God, I'm asking you to help. And you put this in front of me? Really? This is like putting mud. Really? Now, at this time, I was just asking you, Lord, this is too heavy to bear. This cross is too heavy to bear. And now you put more. Take it. Take it in faith. Take it in faith, realizing that you will receive illumination. Your eyes will be opened. Your perspective will be changed. You're, you will gain more wisdom. You will gain more vision. You will like, oh, wow, Lord. I actually followed what you said, and I have a completely different vision. And what happens? You become transformed, just like this man. After the miracle, they were all confused. Was he born blind? Yes, he was born. Back and forth, back and forth. This is what happens when we are before our Christ, our Lord, and he works in our lives, sometimes adding mud, <coughs> things that we do not fully understand. We become transformed, and we become different. People see, he was just like the rest of us. What happened to him? Well, he went, he washed, and his eyes were opened. So how can we see light? We see light by filling your head with lights of words of light, words of light. Our scriptures is full of light. Every time you sit with scriptures, reading your Bible, soaking these words in, this opens your eyes. This gives you spiritual wisdom. Number two, associate with children of light. This world is split into two. World, the children of light, and children of dark, darkness. And we're not there to make fun of or to judge the, 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 the children of darkness or to uh, hate them. Or to, we're not saying that. It says we have to associate with the children of light. Because those who are with the light will help you stay on the light. Those in the darkness will drag you away from the light. Those who are in darkness will drag, out, drag you away from the light. You have to check what kind of people am I surrounding myself with? Who are the people I call myself? I call myself, call them to be my best friends. Are they children of light or children of darkness? If they're the children of light, they will help me to stay in the light. You read Kamani Bahna, children of light, like one of my friends is going into the darkness. No, 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 come back. Come back, where are you going? No, I love you so much. I'm not going to allow you to go there. I'm not going to allow you to, to be in this place. I'm not going to allow you to hang out with these friends. I love you very much. Come on. Let's go to Sunday. Let's go to church this Sunday. Let's go to Tazbih at night on Saturday. Let's go see Abuna. Let's go. Right? This is, this is what it means to be a children of light and a friend of light. Right? We have our eyes out for each other and help bring each other back to the light. So fill your, your head with light, with words of light. Be associated with friends of light, not friends of darkness. Number three, seek counselors. Seek counselors. 
If you realize you are in darkness, do not be in darkness by yourself. Go and seek help. Find a counselor. Find a father of confession. Find a spiritual mentor. Come and tell Buna, I am in the darkness. Come and help me. Don't stay there. Don't stay there and give up. The church is here for you. The sacrament is here for you. This is the place that builds saints. This church, every church, the sacrament. A sacrament, this church is not a museum of the good. It is a hospital of healing. And now we come, realizing that we're in the dark, we come here to come back to the light. Every opportunity for you to sit with a spiritual father, a father of confession, is an ability for you to be restored back to the light. May God give us the courage to realize where we are, to help us to be firm in the light, that we may be the children of the light. And glory be to our God forever and ever. Amen.